Right, turn your Bibles, Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 25. <clears throat> well, it's been about, I think about a month since the last time I taught. So let's do a little, a little bit of reviewing first. Last time I taught, we went through Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Can anyone uh, give me anything they remember from that teaching? Parable of the wise and foolish virgins. Uh, that when we're looking at uh, parables and things like that, not to look too deeply into them. Mm -hmm. uh, if we do, sometimes we'll we'll come up with some strange interpretations. Yes, very good. So these wise and foolish virgins are, are both groups groups that were genuine Christians at one point in time? Yes? Yes. Yes? Okay. Mm -hmm. And how do we know that? They, they, they both had oil mm -hmm. in their lamps. At one point in time? At one point in time. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Both look forward to the wedding feast. Both waiting and watching. So, what was the difference between the two group, the different groups? What was the difference between them? Wise and foolish, okay. Isaiah? Uh, some bring more uh, oil and some bring as much oil as they ran out. Oh, they ran out of oil. Yeah. Mm. So, they didn't persevere to the end. Yeah. Mm. They, weren't adding, they weren't adding to their faith. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Yes. They weren't working out their salvation with fear and trembling. <clears throat> and notice it says in verse uh, 11, what did they call Jesus? Lord, Lord. So they were deceived, right? They were deluded. They, they thought he was their Lord. Which he, he was at some point in time. And what did he say? Did he say, I never knew you in verse 12? No. What did he say? I do not know you. I do not know you. Mm -hmm. And in verse 13, we talked about this uh, you know, a couple teachings ago. It says, Watch well, therefore, for you know neither the day or the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Now, in the, in the Greek, the word know there, oida, what tense is it in? Remember that? No, nope, not present. Start to the P, though. Tense. It's in the perfect tense. What does that mean, Brother Tracy? Um, I'm not too sure about the whole tenses thing. I get confused on all okay. that. Brother John? It applies to everyone. They don't know right now. Yeah, they don't know right now. Perfect tense is a past thing that has um, validity up to the present. So what he's saying is no one has known, and at the current time, no one knows the day or the hour. That's what perfect tense means. Okay? And that's what it, Jesus is saying in Matthew 24 and verse 36. But we do know that at some point in time, someone, a group of people will know. And how will they know? What sign? What particular sign will they know by? The coming of the Son of Man. Yeah, well, how, how, what particular sign will they, will they know the day in which Christ will return? Abomination and desolation. Abomination and desolation, right. And how many days after that will the Son of Man return, according to Daniel? Uh, 2,550 days. Oh, that's the middle part. I'm sorry. 1,290 days, according to Daniel 12. 1,290 days from the abomination of desolation. So those who are alive when the abomination of desolation happens, when the new temple is built, the end of Christ stands in the temple of God, declares that to be God, that from that point on, 1,290 days from then, the, the, the Christ will return. Christ will return. So there is a group of people who will know. So when it says, you do not know the day or the hour, it does not mean that no one can ever know. No one ever, ever will know. It's simply saying in perfect tense, no one has, no one, no one at this current time knows. Okay, so make sure we get that down. But all, all the people that have made predictions in the past about Jesus coming not based on this issue of the abomination of desolation have shown themselves to be wrong. Yes, anyone who's make, making a prediction on the day Christ will return, up until now, has been a false prophet, has been wrong. Because they haven't seen the abomination of desolation happen. 
Not only that, they haven't seen um, the two witnesses, which you know is the beginning of the, the last week that Daniel talks about. This always has a present application. So it's, a, it's like a rolling present application. But God, only the Father knows the day and the hour when the Son is born. That's perfect tense. Right. So at that point in time when Jesus is saying this, no one has known. And, and no one knows at that point in time. It doesn't block the future that they will know. That's right. right. Yeah, someone in the future can know. Right. And, and the fact that Jesus in Matthew 24 and verse 15 points back to the abomination of desolation that Daniel talked about in Daniel 12 right. tells us that someone will know at some point in time. Right. Yeah, so Jesus would not contradict Daniel and what God revealed to him. I'm not criticizing, I'm saying you're right. I, I yeah, yeah. Just yeah, thank you. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on to the parable of the talents today. And we'll start in verse 14 and read through verse 30. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, another two, another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid, and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and I gather where I have not got scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I received back my own with interest. Therefore take the talent from him, and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we've seen here um, several parables so far. This is the second one of Matthew 25, but several parables in a row. You see in Matthew 24, verses 45 through 51. And you see the parable of the wise and foolish virgin we just talked about in uh, Matthew 25, 1 through 13. And both parables are talking about those who profess Christ. This large group of people who profess Christ. <coughs> and of course, in the parable in Matthew 24, the servant who uh, was a hypocrite was cast uh, into, his, his portion was with the hypocrites, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. Uh, said would not let them in. The door was already shut to them. So they were not allowed to enter into the kingdom. Okay? These are all people who think they belong to Christ, uh, who think he's their Lord. And so we see, that once again, the same thing happening here in the parable of the talents. Uh, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country. So he traveled to a far country. Now, if someone travels to a far country, they're going to be gone for how long? Quite a while. They're going to be gone for a while. Okay? He'd gone for a long time. But before he left, he called his servants and delivered his goods to them. Now, what is his goods? Well, I, I think that can be a lot of different things included in that. He's calling them to be stewards over the things of God. Uh, we know that in John 14, Jesus said, If I don't go away from you, the Holy Spirit cannot come to you. But if I go away, the Holy Spirit will come to you. And you do greater things than even I have done. So that's part of the goods. There's also um, spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit has given to the church. And we'll look at that here in a second. There's also natural abilities that God has given each person. Okay, so these are the goods that God has delivered to Christians 
Uh, and even those who are not Christians have natural abilities given to them by God, because James 1.17 says that every good and perfect thing comes down from the Father of lights. Okay, so he, he brings these things and gives them to you, these good and perfect gifts. <clears throat> and we know from 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 19 through 20, that you were bought with a price, and you are not your own. God owns you. You're a servant of God. And so everything you have belongs to him. He, he delivered these goods to you. And he expects you to be good stewards over them, as we see in this parable, to produce fruit from the things that God has given you. And one he gave, in verse 15, and one he gave five talents to another two, to another one in each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a long, or he went on a journey. Okay, so he gave each according to their ability. So not each person is going to have the same natural abilities. Each person is not going to have the same spiritual gifts. Okay, let's just turn to Romans 12 for a second here. We'll look at some of these spiritual gifts and see what the Holy Spirit said through the Apostle Paul in Romans 12. And we'll also go to 1 Corinthians 12. And <clears throat> so this, this, this one lazy and wicked servant who we don't want to be like was given something to him by God. Something was given to him by God. Even though it was small, smaller than the other things that were given to the other two servants, he still did nothing with it. God forbid we be found like that. We be found a wicked and a lazy servant whom the abilities God has given us, whether they be natural or spiritual abilities, we do nothing with them. God forbid. Romans 12, verse 3. For I say through the grace given to me, so this is a grace given to him, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt. So we ought to think soberly about ourselves. Not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. Okay? Verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. So we have different gifts given to us according to the grace from God, according to what God chooses it's his, it's, it's his obligation to choose. We can't dispute with that about him. Um, now, he may give some people the gift of prophecy, and some people not. He may give some people the gift of speaking in tongues, some people not. He may give some people the gift of healing people, and some people not. And, uh, you know, if someone goes around healing people and they're genuinely getting healed, I'm not talking about Benny Hinn nonsense, but genuinely getting healed, we're not to covet or be jealous of them. Um... They're no more important to the body of Christ than someone who can't heal somebody. Uh, a pastor slash teacher, though he may be out in front more than other people in the part of the body of Christ, he's no more important or special in God's eyes than someone who does not have that gift. And so these people who we're talking about in the parable of talents, the one who's given five and two and one, the one that was given one is no, more, no less special to God than the one who's given five. But God has decided to do it this way. And we'll see that he'll reward the five and the two the same exact way. He doesn't reward the one who had five more better than he rewarded the one who had two more. He rewarded them the same way because they did everything they could according to the ability they have, according to what God blessed them with. And so you're called to do what God has given you. Not to seek after things that God has not given you, or be covetous after things that God has not given you, I'm not saying you can't pray for certain gifts. You can pray for those things. Um, but we're to look for these gifts within ourselves, pray to God, say, God, what gift have you given me? And then walk in that, and walk, whenever it may be. Verse 5, So we being many are one, in, one body in Christ, individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. And some people have more money than other people. They may be called to give more. That's all there is to it. I've, I've kind of uh, relinquished the idea that I'm ever going to have a lot of money. And I'm okay with that. I have no problem with that. But if God ever would have blessed me with more money, I wouldn't use it to spend it on worldly things. I'd use it to give more liberally. Which what we all should be thinking when God blesses us with more money. Well, can I build up my treasures in heaven, on heaven or on earth? Which one are you going to do? For where your treasures, your heart will be also. 
We use it in proportion to our faith. So he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, not everyone's called to be a leader. If everyone's leading, who's following? I mean, imagine what that would be like if everyone wanted to be a leader. would be going 10 different directions. wouldn't be too pretty. He who, sh he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And so we see these things that God gives, he chooses to give who he gives to, and we ought to use the gifts we do have for God's glory and to produce much fruit for him. 1 Corinthians 12. Starting in verse 4, we'll read through verse 11. There are diversities of gifts or various kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Now notice that, for the profit of all. That wicked and lazy servant, did he use what was given to him for the profit of all? He hid it. He did nothing with it. That's why God calls him lazy. Yeah. Well, I don't think he was really afraid. I think he's saying that to try to blame God. And we'll get to that here in a minute. But uh, for, one, for one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. As he wills. And so you, you know, even if you were to seek after a certain gift that, that you thought God wanted you to seek after, he's not obligated to give them to you. No matter how much you pray, no matter how much you fast, he's not obligated to give them to you. Let the Lord lead you in that. First Peter chapter four. <clears throat> uh, verses ten and eleven. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we do it for the glory of God. And... Um, you know, these, these men who, or these servants of God who were, were ministering properly, who received fruit from what they did in their labors, um, you know, they, I don't think they were looking for rewards necessarily. Uh, that's kind of like an added thing. I, you know, personally, I, I look forward more to hearing well done, good and faithful servant than any of that other stuff. That's just added stuff. But we are to work according to the ability given to us by God. Because everything belongs to Him. Everything good we've been given has been given to us by Him. We were bought with a price, the precious blood of Christ. Belong to Him. We ought to use things for His glory. And so it gives it a synopsis in verses 16 through 18 of what they did. And we'll get to what they did here in a second again. Let's go through the other verses. But in verse 19, it says, After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled the council. So a long time. You know, I've been studying uh, preterism more lately, and hopefully when we get to our study on Reve Revelation, I'm going to go through some of those different eschatological views to show you why I think they're false. And preterism is basically based off of these time frame statements that we see in the Bible of, you know, he's coming quickly. Uh, and, you know, we've talked about the whole generation in Genea and what that can mean and how, you know, this generation will by no means pass away until all of these things take place, you just said in Matthew 24. And so we talked about these things, but we see here this an opposite of he's coming quickly here after a long time uh, he went to a far country and so when we're interpreting the scripture when it comes to eschatology you need to think about these things as well when he came back after a long time he settled accounts with the servants you know in revelation chapter 20 we see the first resurrection 
And who is resurrected in the first resurrection? The dead, dead in Christ, or rise first, who's rise second? Those who are alive, who are in Him. Okay, all right. Now, when Christ returns, what's the what you know? What's He going to do? He's going to stomp out the grapes of wrath. And who are they? Well, those are the ones at the mark of the beast who are fighting on on Satan's side. Antichrist side, he'll stomp out the grapes of wrath. And so do you think it's possible that there'll be some people who are Christian in name only, who have maybe even gone into the, the hiding place, who know what the scriptures say about the end times, they have not taken the mark of the beast. Do you think there's such thing as those kind of people who will be on earth? Who know the gospel, who know what's required of them, who know what, what the Bible says about what God tells them to repent, to forsake all their sins and follow him, I'm not talking about people who are ignorant of those things, who will probably encompass the people who are left on earth during the thousand-year reign. I'm talking about people who know the truth, have not obeyed it, but have not taken the mark of the beast, are not on, on Antichrist's side in the physical sense, but are in the hiding place because they, they know the scriptures. They've been taught proper eschatology. They've been taught about the signs to look for, and they're looking for these signs, but in their heart of hearts, they're still living in wickedness. Is that a possibility? But they don't have the Holy Spirit. But they don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. They're foolish virgins that we just talked about before. Right. And so we have these two groups here. And so even if you make it past stomping out the grapes of wrath, even if you make it past the Antichrist and the mark of the beast, friends, don't think, don't be deluded just because you have intellectual head knowledge of these things and you make it through all those things that you're okay with God. That God won't separate you and say, you can't be in my kingdom. Because that's what I think is going to happen at the first resurrection will be rewarded. It says right here. It says he will settle accounts with them. And in those groups that he's settling accounts with will be those who profess to be Christians and those who really are Christians. And so I, I think people, even when they have good eschatology, they might get thick in their mind, well, I, they have a false sense of assurance. I'll, I'll make it past the Antichrist. I'll make it past that little, that little uh, th you know, why in the road there. I'll make it past that. I'll go into the hiding place where God will provide for the saints for a period of time. And I'll act like I'm one of the saints, but they're really not. But when Christ settles accounts with his servants, those who claim to be his servants, what will he say to you? If that were to happen today, Christ would return to, you know, we're in the hiding place, the Antichrist is out there doing his thing, and for three and a half years we're hiding, we're protected. You know, may, or maybe you're not protected. Maybe you're in a dungeon somewhere and you're, you're being persecuted because you won't take the mark of the beast. But do you think that by not taking the mark of the beast that proves you're a Christian? No. By no means. This is serious stuff, friends. We can't play with God. We can't play games with Him. We've got to be living holy. Not only because we could die at any time and we can be brought into judgment because of that, but because if we make it through all this stuff, He's still going to call you to give an account on that first judgment. For he will settle his account with the servants. Those who have been his at some point in time, but when these accounts are settled, they're not his. They're not his. And we see the difference here. The difference is those who faithfully serve God, we thought we heard faithfulness last week, didn't we? Those who faithfully serve God and those who don't. Those who do something with what God has given them and those who hide it. Like a lamp under a uh, under a uh, under a bushel. Like salt that is that's good for nothing to be trampled underfoot by men. They're not holy. That's right. They're not holy. But with that holiness, no man will see the Lord. Verse twenty. So he he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides. Now I was reading this. And I immediately thought, my children saying, "Look, Dad, look what I'm doing." You know, they, they were, they were boldly trying to, trying to get my attention. They were saying, "Look, look what I've done, Daddy." They want me to be, you know, proud. I guess you could say, or, or pleased. Better it's better word. Pleased with what, uh, what I've uh, they've done, and and that's what I don't tell them. I'm proud of them. I, mean, I know, I know that's kind of a cultural thing here. We say that, we, but we don't. We want to switch our language around and be more biblical language, and so. I, I, like I told my son last night, I said, Malachi, I'm very pleased with the way you, you witnessed tonight. I, I said, I, 
I'm, I'm, I thank God you're my son. You know, and, and so I, that, that's the kind of things we want to tell our children. You know? But he, he said he was coming, coming to, his, to his, his Savior and saying, Look, he wasn't ashamed. Look what I have done for you. Could you say that to Jesus? Look what I have done, Lord. Or would you say, Oh, oh Lord, I didn't do too much. Oh, oh Lord, I, I hid it. Okay, look, look, Lord, I did it. You know, let's turn to First John for a second here. And we'll talk about those who can come boldly. Those who can come boldly like this man with the five talents did. First uh, John chapter 2, verse 28. It says, And now little children abide in him, that when he appears, he may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. So where's the connection here of the, the man with the five talents or the servant with the five talents who can come before him boldly and have confidence because he's abiding in him that when he appears, he's not ashamed because he's practicing righteousness. And that's how you know you're born of him. That's how you know you're born of him. First John 3. I'm sorry, First John 4, verse 17. Love has been perfected among us in this, that you may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Are you like he in this world? As he was, are you like he in this world? Are you just blending in with the world? Or are you sticking out like a sore thumb in the world? Does the whole world hate you because you testify of its wicked works like, like Jesus did in John 7.7? 7? Can you have boldness before on the day of judgment? Because love has been perfected in us? That as he was, so are you in this world? Are you abiding in him? We know in 1 John 3, verse 6, whoever abides in him does not sin. Yes, abiding in him. We can have confidence and not be ashamed. This first, task, first servant was not ashamed. He had boldness. He had confidence. Look what I've done. Strive for that, friends. That you can have boldness and confidence in the day and say, look what I have done, Lord. Not be ashamed and say, Lord, I didn't do this, I didn't do that, I should have done this, I didn't do that. To have no regrets. Be faithful. Be faithful. And his Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy. Faith without works is dead. Exactly. Some people say, well, that's works, and I'm not required to do it. No, it's, it's, a, it's a part of faithfulness. Mm -hmm. It's a part of holy living. It's a part of true biblical faith, right. a live exactly. faith. Exactly. Right. If, you don't, if you don't, your life doesn't produce holiness and obedience to the point where you can have confidence before him and not be ashamed and be bold before him on the day of judgment that it's love is being perfected among you, then, then you don't have true faith. You have a demonic faith, according to James 2. So, well done, good and faithful servant. Good and faithful. No? So, there's a, you can be good, huh? No. I mean, Jesus is saying this here. So, they obviously actually are good. So, you can be good. Yeah, you can be holy. And faithful servant, you're faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Let's go to Luke 16 here. Now this is obviously talking about when Christ returns, making you a ruler over many things. We'll get to that here in a second in Luke 19. But Luke 16 is referring to a principle, I think Brother Mitch might have mentioned it last week, but it's referring to principle here on earth, while you're still on earth. Have your faithful and little, God will bless you with much. Uh, Luke 16, verse 10 through verse 12. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is at least is unjust also in much. 
If you, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? If you've not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Yes. Young people especially need to learn this. If you're faithful in little, God will bless you with more. If you're not faithful in little, he will not bless you with more. Now there's people who have gotten more who have not been faithful in little, but it's not God blessing them. That's more of a cursing than it is a blessing. Because if you're not faithful in little and you just keep on getting more and more and more for yourself, and you're not faithful in the much, you're just heaping cursings upon yourself. Not blessings. Judgment upon yourself. You know, I think about all these prosperity gospel preachers who, who they, they gained a little. They, and some of them may have actually started out good. I don't really know the history of all of them. Uh, but they have a lot. And they're just, by having that much stuff, they're just heaping judgments upon themselves. I, I'd rather be poor as poor can be and be faithful and poor than have all the riches and to take my heart away and I'd be unfaithful and lose Jesus Christ and gain this world. So be faithful in little. If you be faithful in the riches of this world, God will bless you with true riches according to your ability, as Jesus says here in Matthew 25. Let me see in Luke 19, uh, the parable of the Minas. This is very similar to the, the parable of talents here, not the same thing. Uh, in, in that day and age, 60 minas equaled one talent. Uh, one talent, as we talked before, between 60 to 100 pounds worth of silver or gold. And 60 to 100 pounds worth of gold in this day and age are probably worth about a million dollars, or somewhere up, up to a million dollars, 100 pounds. And, uh, you know, 60 to 100 pounds of silver, the 100 pounds is probably worth about $10,000. Okay? Um, so it doesn't say in Matthew 25 if it's gold or silver, but if it's gold, I mean, this is not some small amount of money. He's given them quite a bit. And what we ought to understand from that is this. When you are blessed with spiritual responsibilities, you have great responsibility. Great responsibility. When you are blessed with eternal life, you have great responsibility to share that with others. Great responsibility. Owning a Bible is Amen. Yeah. Can you put out the breakdown of responsibility, that word, how you said it before? Yeah, responsibility, that's good. Thank you, brother. Uh, it's two different words, response and able, response and ability. You have the ability to respond to what God has commanded of you, what God has demanded of you. And because you are response able, that's why you're responsible. If you are not able to respond as some Christian theology teaches you, then you have no responsibility before God. Because you're able to respond, because everyone's able to respond to the gospel, they all have responsibility before God to obey the gospel, you know, as they've heard it. So the parable of the Minas. Let's just read this through real quick. I'm not going to, I'm just going to touch on a couple things here. As they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country, far country again, to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas, and called, said to them, Do business till I come. So do work, labor until I come. How long do you labor until? Until what? Until I come. You don't stop before that. You labor until he comes. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. So it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded the servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Master, your mina, one mina, has earned ten minas. He multiplied it by ten. He said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in very little, have authority over ten cities. Now what do you think this is referring to? And it goes on to say different things for different cities here. But he's referring to Revelation chapter 20. When Christ returns and reigns for a thousand years, and who will reign with him? The saints. Not the ain'ts. The saints. Not those who uh, were Christians at one point in time, did not labor faithfully, but the saints. Not those who didn't have enough oil in their lamp to, do, to last to the end, but the saints. Not the servant who beat his other servants, whether through doctrine or physically, but the saints. 
Revelation 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They lived and reigned with Christ. They reigned with Christ for a thousand years. I would say so, yeah. Yeah. Just during the morning, random, not, not the great white throne judgment. No, no, no. No, only, only God judges the great white throne judgment. The blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such. The second death has no power, but they shall be priests and of, uh, of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him a thousand years. So the faithful people will reign with him. We see the parable of the Minas, and we see this once again. He's blessing them, have rule over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So those who are faithful will reign with Christ for a thousand years. Verse 22. He who also received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I get, have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you rule over many things. Same response here. He did according to his ability. That's, what, that's the way God's going to judge you. He's going to judge you according to the things he's given you the spiritual gifts he's given you, he's not going to judge you for not healing people if you don't have the gift of healing. He's not going to judge you for not prophesying if he's not given the gift of prophesying. He's not going to judge you for not interpreting tongues if he hasn't given the gift of interpreting tongues. He's going to judge you according to what he has given you. And if he's given you much, much will be required of you. If he's given you little, you'll still have something required of you. And he'll bless you, he'll reward you according to what you have done with what he has given you. You know, it's kind of like if I see someone who's seen a thousand souls saved because he has much greater influence, his message is being spread. You know, I'd like to say Billy Graham, but he's kind of gone off the deep end. But, you know, the message is spread far and wide, and he's seen thousands of people saved. Then you have this one guy who's true preached on the corner faithfully day in and day out, and he's seen maybe a hundred people be saved. Do you, do you think God is going to judge more harshly than one who only had a hundred saved? And the one who had a thousand saved? No, he said, judge according to their abilities, to what God's given them, and the knowledge they have. That's the way, and, and you see the same response from Jesus here. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things, I will make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. <laughs> same response, still less fruit. And we should long for those words, friends. We should long for those words. To hear him say those things. Then the one who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. It almost seems like this man is blaming God for his not doing something with what God has given him. Are you going to be able to blame God for your lack of faithfulness? Because you feared him? And he says, I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. So he did not labor. He was not faithful. He made no use of what God had given him. No use of what God had given him. And here's God's response to him. But the Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. He said, he's basically saying, do something. Do the least you can do. Do something with what I have given you. Is it true that, uh, that God reaps where he has not sown, and he gathers where he has not scattered seed? Is that true? Okay. So who does the sowing and scattering? Uh, saints. Yeah, the saints. Yeah. Who does the reaping? Remember the parable of the wheat and tares? Did we do the reaping and pull out the tares? Yeah, the angels did what God, Christ commands them to do it, but they do it. Yeah, so, so God ultimately is the source of it. But we do the sowing, we do the scattering. That is our obligation to preach the word of God. You know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, let's just turn there for a second, 1 Corinthians 3. God does reaping. Yeah. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 5. Who then is Paul? 
who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Yes. And so Paul has the proper perspective between the sowers and the scatterers and the reaper. I am nothing. He is everything. This last servant has the improper perspective. You're a hard man. You know, and if you go to Luke 19, you're an austere man. They look at God in the wrong way. Not as if he deserves everything and all the glory. And I am nothing, but I am something I feared you, I hid it around the ground. No, he had a proper perspective. Something we read about before in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. We had a, you shouldn't think of yourself more highly than you ought. So we ought to do something, anything, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we won't be able to blame him for our unfaithfulness. <laughs> Therefore take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given. And you'll have an abundance. But for him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the and watch what happens to this unfaithful servant. Okay? And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the unprofitable servant, the one who doesn't work for God and do what he's not faithful to God, he doesn't do what he's supposed to do. Does he lose rewards? Or does he lose eternity? There's not a loss of rewards here, friends. He's being cast the same place, the hypocrite in Matthew 24, and verse 51 is being cast. Uh, he's being cast the same place that the, uh, in Matthew 22 and verse 13, the one who did not have his wedding garments on. He was cast the same place. Those two groups of people are cast. And they will not be in the kingdom of God. They'll be in outer darkness. And their final resting place will be hellfire. Gehenna, the lake of fire. That'll be their final resting place. So there isn't just a loss of rewards here. There's a loss of eternal life because he wasn't faithful. Yes, brother? This might be a little uh, kind of beyond it into this, but this idea of outer darkness, do you think that means he's ever, do you think he's talking about the fact that since he's the light of the kingdom, he's saying you're not in the kingdom, you're going to be in the darkness outside the kingdom? And that's just kind of a preliminary judgment before mm -hmm. I, I would say it's talking about Hades. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, I don't think it's talking about the, uh, because, you know, when Christ returns the first time and he's judging his servants, the only people that are cast in the lake of fire when Christ initially returns is the beast, there's the false yeah, prophet, yeah. and the antichrist. And so, not until the white throne judgment over a thousand years later does he cast people in the lake of fire. Yeah, so, yeah. these people are going to Hades, um, which, you know, I know this is issue of darkness, there's a, a fire there, if you go to Luke 16, the, you know, uh, the rich man of Lazarus, you see a, a fire there, a, a desire for water to quench his thirst, and none's given to him. Uh, Whatever Hades is like, and whatever Gehenna and the Lake of Fire are like, it's the most miserable place you could possibly think of. That's what we need to realize here. People make a big deal in saying, well, fire produces light. How can there be outer darkness in light? Well, I, I think there is a type of fire that doesn't produce any light. It's, it's really like almost like invisible. It's like the hottest kind of heat you can get. What's that? Racing fuel is that way. It's so, so potent. Burns invisibly. Right. And if you've ever seen fires in, in racing pits, you'll see the guys running around there, they're trying to put each other out. And they're on fire, but you can't see in fire. Mm -hmm. And so, with that kind of fire that God can make naturally, then God certainly can make supernatural fire that uh, is outer dark or. And invisible. make bodies that can't be burned up by it. Bodies that cannot be burned up by it. Right. That's correct. So, very really, uh, incredible to think uh, of. But. So, uh, of course, the, the same thing applies to what Brother Sean was saying. Because they're not in that place of his kingdom dwelling right. with him. Where the light is. Yeah. Yeah, where the light is, mm -hmm. and there's no more sun, no more moon. Yeah. And so they're in a place where there's, there's no light. I do think it's a literal darkness. Yeah. I was wondering if it was, I like, do. I just wondering if it's possible, because they're all... Like, isn't there also a story about a thief coming in, like a robber, the same as a thief and robber, and then he cast out? Isn't there another... I'll find the talks about people being actually kicked out of the kingdom if they try to get in. Mm -hmm. That's 
Um, that's what I was wondering. But actually, maybe it was literal. You're saying you're not in my light, and then later he'll judge him. Mm -hmm. Final judgment. I wonder if they're going to enter another way. Yeah. You're saying you're not in my kingdom. You know, it's important. You have to enter through the door. Thieves and robbers are trying to enter another way. Yeah. I, I thought of this too. I want to share this. He, um, when he puts them in the outer darkness, right now, this world, even when it becomes dark, we have the moon and the stars to give us some light. It's mm -hmm. not 100% unless you go into a room and shut the door and seal everything up. But when we still have, everywhere on earth, everywhere in the universe, we still have the light of God. We still have his presence. His, his light is there a little bit. But, I mean, not, not a little bit, a lot. Now, in outer darkness, I think it's withdrawn. Mm -hmm. And he says, I am totally washing my hands of you. You're done. Mm -hmm. For all eternity. I could not imagine mm -hmm. to take that say okay I here's the gospel take it and then say I'd yeah. rather have I'd rather have out of darkness are you kidding me <laughs> yeah. I mean that's yeah. that's, that's insanity right I can't imagine someone wanting that over salvation there's definitely um, when it comes second Thessalonians 1 9 says this they should be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord from the glory of his power mm -hmm. Uh, Second Thessalonians one nine, yeah. Uh, talking about the wicked when he returns, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not. So they should be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Now I don't, I don't by any means think that God ceases to be omnipresent when He comes in His kingdom. He'll still be omnipresent. Even David says, "When I go down to the depths, there you are." And so I still think he, His His presence yeah, will be there. Would, since that would erase His omnipresence. Yeah, so he's still in the present, but his presence, his manifest presence, uh, his, the conviction yeah, of God. Right. So, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say he's not there in that sense, but. Yeah, uh, something wrong with what I just said. Yeah, I was just wondering if that was a little, just more literal in that sense, in that context, that was actually a literal thing, like taking out the kingdom. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like anybody, you know, if you were a servant, you got to put yourself in their, in their shoes, you know. Oh, I'm in here, and he says, no, take him out. Right. And now you're going to be complaining against God. You know, I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that. Right. Outside complaining and cursing God because you are in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only, the only place to be outside the kingdom in that sense is to be in Hades waiting the final judgment. Because there will be people who will, will be on the earth during that time who um, do not, who before Christ returned, he was not their Lord or Savior. And he's ruling over them for a thousand years. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, as I read the scriptures more and more about these things, that the group is narrowing down in my mind as to who would, could possibly be a part of that group. And it cannot be people who profess to be Christians who are not. No matter if they went into hiding, they knew all of the scriptures about eschatology or not, they are not a part of that group. They are not. Um, Some of those people have churchianity and not Christianity. Mm -hmm. I don't see that here, but the politics and mm -hmm. the, the prestige that comes from being in some churches and, the, mm -hmm. and who you are because you sit on the church board and all that disgusting nonsense. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. uh, there's more reasons to be in a church like that because of what it makes you. The, the focus is not really Christ in those people's lives. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, um, as far as that third group, I have a theory that it could be uh, children who haven't reached a knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. That could be part of that group. I'm not saying that's the all-inclusive group, but mm -hmm. I think that that's probably going to make up a good number of that group. Right. Is what I, what I theorize on that. That could be it. There's probably a lot of people who've never heard the gospel and who are living according to the knowledge they have. That could be part of it. Yeah. But... Uh, I guess I didn't think about the other scripture we just read too, talking about uh, the Minas, where he brought the servant before him and said, Slay him. Right. At the very end of that passage, yep. Those who would not have me to reign over them. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's Luke 19, 27, I think. Part A and Part B. Okay, so. Uh,
any other questions or objections? Or to the, like the Catholic Church, they believe in that, that they believe in the seven steps of grace. Mm -hmm. You know, and some people, because I'm baptized, I'm a Christian. You know, those people. You know, because I go to church, I'm a Christian. I say, well, because, then because you stand in a car in a garage, does that make you a car? Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, people because I do something therefore I am uh, you know that, that, that doesn't hold water mm -hmm. because I went to church 50 years and I had perfect attendance I'm a Christian mm -hmm. I'm a good person uh, I think those people it's tragic that those people have been in that group some, mm -hmm. you know, some are saved but not we, only God knows who they are mm -hmm. saved or lost Sure is. A lot of people who think they're Christian, they're not. He's heartless. He doesn't care who he destroys mm -hmm. and how he does it. Mm -hmm. Definitely all ought to examine ourselves to make sure. Uh, you were you know, talking about that fear that the wicked servant had. I don't know if you mentioned it or not. Maybe I missed it. Yeah, I mentioned it. Yeah, I think he's trying to blame God for his his laziness, his wickedness, his unfaithfulness as to why he didn't take what God had given him and do something with it. Where did you see that? What's that? Where, where did you see that? See what? That he was trying to blame God. Well, he says right here, he says um, why he didn't do something with it. Um, verse 24. And he who had received that one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you had not sown and gathering where you had not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent on the ground. Look, there, what you have is yours. So he's afraid because he's calling him a hard man. And that's why he didn't do anything with it. You're going to blame God? Right, you're going to blame God for your unfaithfulness? That doesn't work. That's blame shifting. It is. And he's saying in verse 27, you ought, to do, you ought to have done something. The least you could have done is deposit in the bank, and that wouldn't have required any activity from you. It's a one time thing. One time thing? Yeah, one activity. You know, it could have got something back from it. We just hit it in the ground. Isn't it something about centered in ourselves, even? We're never, how people think they're never wrong. Mm -hmm. And how hard it is to get people to see that they are wrong and they need to get saved. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're, especially you guys witness a lot, you know. Um, That's when they think they're saved. Right. It's hard to get someone unsaved. Right. That's probably the yeah, hardest. That's, yeah, that's because true. they think they're saved. They think they're okay with God. They're not examining themselves. They're deceived. They can speak it, speak churchianity or churchianese. They can speak it like anyone else. And they think they're okay with God. And they'll even criticize other people who, who aren't okay with God if they're okay with God. But they're not okay with God themselves. They're not examining themselves. And those are the hardest people to talk to because they don't want to think for a second about themselves. They couldn't be saved. And uh, you know, so here in the Bible Belt especially, you yeah. find that a lot. Add to that the cults, mm -hmm. Mormonism, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, that's, that's another whole thing. Yeah, I find it the most difficult is probably the people who think they're Christians and they're not, though. Yeah, they're right. probably the most difficult. How, how, do you, uh, how do you, from your experience, a person that's in that place uh, come to a tr true knowledge of their state before God when they think that you know they have knowledge of the things of the Lord and right. how, how, how can they possibly get to that place? I mean, they're well, they need to humble themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, they, need to, they need to humble themselves, and that's you know something I can't reproduce in somebody. Uh, but what does bring humility? The law of God, the scriptures, uh, will humble people scripture into them and ask them a question then they have to answer mm -hmm. you can't tell them you have to ask them and get the scripture inside of them ask them where the scripture is. I, th I think I'd be specific as possible with them as far as their yeah. sin you know are you lusting are you are you getting drunk are you lying are you stealing are you being selfish 
Is your life revolving around you or is it revolving around Christ? Are you picking up your cross daily, denying yourself and following Him? Are you keeping the commandments of God? Just be real specific about it because then they see the, the truth and the sword of the Spirit, divided soul and spirit, bone and marrow, will show them that they're not okay with God. Uh, but some, I mean, some people are under so much delusion that they're okay with God. Uh, it takes the Holy Spirit to break through them. And uh, no amount of our activity or words will do anything for them. I run into those people sometimes, especially here in the, you know, the Bible belt that holds up the pants of hypocrisy. You know, we 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 see this all the time. Yeah. So it's uh it's all around us, and uh, it just takes a lot of. I mean, yeah, people have to examine themselves. It's self-examination. Be honest with themselves to see if they're really in the faith or not. You should know them by their fruits. We can at uh, one time be honest with ourselves, and then over time we can start becoming dishonest with mm -hmm. ourselves. And yeah. think that I, 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 would, I, I I'm, you know, I don't, I don't need. I began in the spirit. Now I'm being perfected in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Now, and that becoming dishonest with ourselves over a period of time, right. where we can end up in that place. Right. If someone could begin in the spirit and then start deceiving themselves. The scripture admonishes us not to deceive ourselves. Right. Why would it say that unless we could? And you can go even deeper than the, you know, going down a list of things. Are they doing this, doing that? But are they are they abiding? Do they know Christ? Are they spending time with Him? Uh, you know, day in and day out. Are they are they seeking Him in the secret place? Uh, do they treasure His Word and have an actual relationship with Him? Because I mean, anyone could can keep the commandments of God and, and not do th certain things and do other things, but do they truly know Christ, which is eternal life, according to John 17, 3. This is eternal life, you said, knowing God the Father and the one he has sent, having an intimate personal relationship with him, knowing him, from which flows obedience. You know, so that's, that's the real key. And anyone can walk around and keep the commandments of God, but are, do you know Christ? Right. Do you know him? Do you have a relationship with him? And we saw in verse twenty in, in Matthew twenty five the, the foolish versions. He said, "I do not know you. I don't know you." No. So I have a, a question now. Mm -hmm. There is another place where it says, "I never knew you." Right. That's you, Matthew seven. You think he says that at the uh, uh, white throne judgment, or you think he's saying that is at his coming also? That's possible at the coming as well. Yeah. So if I never knew you, someone who's never been a Christian. So how does that leave room for the third group? Oh, but these are people who are professing to be Christians, though. Oh, even in the other one? Yeah, Matthew 7. There, it says, um, Lord, Lord, mm -hmm. uh, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers, you, you who practice lawlessness. There's a group of people professing to be Christians who are, are false converts, which is talking about there. Mm -hmm. And there's another group of professing Christians who were Christians but fell away. Mm -hmm. And both of those are going to go to hell or Hades uh, at his coming. Yeah, there'll be a judgment at his coming. Yeah, he'll, he'll settle accounts with them. And that's the judgment of the, the lambs and the... That's the first judgment. That's the resurrection. Yeah, that's what we're going to get to next week. Okay. Sorry, I'm <laughs> so we'll get to next week. <laughs> but I appreciate the precursor to that. But yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's the judgment he's talking about there. Okay. Yeah. So. But... Um, yeah, the group that I believe will be, he'll be ruling over for a thousand years are a group of people who don't know him, don't claim to know him. Mm -hmm. But never took the mark. Never took the mark. Right. Yeah, which I, I, think, I think, like you said, I think people who have not come to the state of accountability as understanding, they would be in that group, definitely. Right. Do you believe there will be people that are unsaved in the millennial kingdom that yeah. rule over? Yeah, during the thousand year reign. Yeah. Yeah, Zechariah 14 talks about this. Yeah. And... Uh, who rule him with a rod of iron. Right. He said that if they do not come up to Jerusalem to worship him, that he will not send rain upon their land. In Zechariah 14. Your and so they'll, and th those are the people, you know, as they marry and have children and they live, I don't know how long they're going to live. The, the, the Bible said they'll live longer than they live now because their bodies will be changed. Well, Curses is, is removed, yep, right. when Christ returns. Yep. And, um, and so they'll, they'll live on earth 
And then when Satan's released for a short period of time at the very end of the thousand year reign, they'll be, a lot of them will be deceived again and come up to Jerusalem and they'll be wiped out and then a white throne judgment will be installed. And that'll be it. And then eternity will, be, will begin. I yeah. didn't ask you this question before, brother, but uh, during the millennial reign, isn't there a verse or verse that talks about making a decision by the hundredth year? Making a decision by the hundredth oh, year? Sorry, making a decision to submit to Christ by the hundredth year of their life? No, no, I don't know that. It does say that, that it says, uh, I think in Zechariah, children will die at 100 years old. Well, that's Isaiah 65. Isaiah? Okay. Yeah. It says they've got a child who will die and live that long. Right. So that, and that age, you know, he was under the curse, though. There was still a, ch there was still a child, though, at 100 years old. And so that's the, uh, yeah, Isaiah 65, verse 20. Uh in fact, let's just start in verse 17 to get the context. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. The former shall not be remembered or come to, to mind. And Isaiah 65, 17, I just read. Verse 18. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For I behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing. And her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her. We see that in Revelation 21, 4. Or the voice of crying. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old. It's still a child 100 years old. But the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. That's what I'm getting at, though. That they uh, become a child in Christ by 100, or if they refuse his rulership, they're accursed. I don't, I don't think it's saying, I don't think it's saying that, though, brother. I don't think it's saying that, brother. I mean, it says the child shall die 100 years old. I think it's just simply Some saying. Some say that's the age of accountability is 100. That's, that's where I'm going. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I've not saying that. you're saying that. I'm just saying that's that's where I'm getting that from. Okay. And I'm not saying that's right either. But yeah, I don't. That's kind of, that's kind of up. Yeah, I don't. There's a lot of I think that's kind of, opinion that's kind of read into it. I think all it's saying there is that, uh, I think all it's saying there is that people are going to live a long time, and, th and those who are those who are sinners will will live shorter times. Well, yeah, longer than, but the age of longer than now. If the age of accountability is hundred, that means a child is hundred. Yeah. Right. You're yeah. right. So people are going to live a lot longer than now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you think it's going to be the same people living the entire thousand years? Oh, I don't think that. I mean, it, I thought it would say that. I mean, that's possible, I guess, because it's before wrong. the flood, they lived to be. Not actually nine years old. Yeah, so if you're only a child at a hundred, I mean, then living to be a thousand wouldn't be so far fetched. Yeah, unless you're a sinner. That means you're going to live a hundred years of innocence. Yeah, hundred years of innocence. So, you know, e even if the first generation who's part of that thousand-year reign does live through the whole thing, they're going to have children. 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 There's going to be many generations right. during that. Um, and the fact that they're all living so long means the population will grow more quickly. Right. Because people aren't dying off. Right. No. Which is more people for say and it's amazing that even then when Christ is in the flesh, ruling on earth, people will still be deceived by Satan right. and go with him to the Jerusalem to shows his power. To, uh, it shows free will. Yeah, that's your free will. The right, the bodies right near right near Jerusalem will be there. That's right, in the Valley of Gehenna, yeah, it'll be there. The bodies will be there, burning day and night, and people will have to walk past those bodies to get to Jerusalem. That's just a reminder. I mean, the, 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 that whole situation, the whole scenario shows the great grace and mercy of God. He says, "Look, I've shown you all. I mean, more than he's ever shown any of us. He's showing them all this stuff." Allowing them to live with his, you know, like the people did before the flood. They lived to be so old, and he's with them in the in the flesh, ruling them, and and uh, they they see the bodies of the people, which is symbolic of what will happen to those who enter into hell forever. You know, the the burning flesh day in and day out. It's just symbolic of what's going to happen in the forever lake of fire, in Gehenna. And he's giving them all these warnings. And, they have to come worship. Yeah, if they don't, they won't get water on their land. So these are all these things that they're seeing. So we'll see him. Yep. See his glory. See him face to face. Right. Shows your free will. Shows you that God does not, I mean, if anything can come close to forcing someone to be saved, that would be it. 
that'd be it. Yeah. There's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no, I mean, people are atheists today, they have no excuse for being an atheist, but being, being basically, that, that, by rejecting Jesus, you're being an atheist, because he's the only one qualified to be God, and you're rejecting him, therefore you're saying he's not God, uh, I have no God. It's basically like saying you're an atheist. You know, their excuses are even more lacking. I mean, those atheists that we you know, we talked to last night, Ben. Well, if I if I saw Jesus, I, I would I would believe in him. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> you wouldn't. People saw him face to face all the time. Saw his miracles, couldn't believe in him. Right. Why would have been any different? Right. So. Yeah. So they'll actually see the consequence, being able to see the people that are in hell already. Right. And they'll also be able to see the reward, seeing the saints who were in their glorified bodies and seeing both the consequence and the reward and Jesus and reject all of it. Right. And, and the, the That's where the devil won't be there for a thousand years. Right. And it, the devil's not even going to be there influencing. This is just their own free will choice that they're making. It's sure. really amazing. That's some strong will, huh? And we'll see the fact that nobody's dying. <laughs> yeah. yeah really you think amazing. of families now, uh, young people that are raised up in a, in a godly environment and they're, they're seeing evidence, 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 the Lord to, in, in a sense, it can be like that now. Yeah. If, if, a, if a child chooses in the light of all that evidence, all that they've lear learned and seen the light and everything they have, to say, no. Sometimes you're not willing.